All right, and we're live. Hello everyone, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, and welcome to episode number 46 of the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues. Um, today we're gonna be uh, dialoguing with uh, Richard Torres of Jeet Kune Do Martial Arts Institute. So um, let's give him a couple minutes to come online with us. We tested the technology um, yesterday, so Everything should work fine. Okay, take two. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> it was tough. Okay. Wait, you're upside down. Yep, I see you. Okay. Okay, here we are. All right. Sorry, I came in and then I had to leave because I didn't see you, so. No, nah, that's okay. That's all right. Technology for you, what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> all right. But we're here, so yes. that's good. Yes. Okay, so everybody uh, say hello to uh, Sifu Richard Torres. This is the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues episode number 46. And mm -hmm. um, so I was just saying, um, Sifu Richard, that uh, I think it's of significance that you and I are dialoguing on what would have been Brandon Lee's 54th birthday. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. I, I think the Gung Fu gods are definitely smiling <laughs> on us. Right. Yeah. yeah, it was a, it was a very very uh, busy time for Bruce when when Brandon was born. Yeah, because a lot of things happened all at the same time. Yeah, uh, Brandon was born, and then he got uh, called by 20th Century Fox to do the the screen test mm -hmm. for the number one son, which mm -hmm. then later became the Green Hornet. Right. And then his father passed. His father passed away. So right. all those things. Yeah. All in that spam of maybe two weeks and okay. then he left to hong kong you know so okay so guys you see you see what just happened there this is why i'm so excited to talk to this guy but i have to <laughs> tell you right off the bat i do not like you very much and here's why <laughs> right sorry no here's why <laughs> if i took my life savings and i started now trying to duplicate all the stuff that you own uh. i wouldn't live long enough <laughs> you have an amazing, amazing collection. I have never seen anything like it. And just <laughs> for that, I respect the heck out of you. And I will, Thank you. I will defend you <laughs> against anybody, right, who says anything about you when it comes to your dedication to Bruce Lee and the art of Jeet Kune Do. I got your Thank back. You. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Joy. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So, guys, so here's the deal, right? So. This guy is not just a Bruce Lee fan. He's a Bruce Lee fanatic, right? <laughs> but he's also as dedicated to the practice of the art, the development and evolution of the art, and the preservation of the art. And I think that's where, that's where we, we all owe him you know, high honors and high respect. So it is my pleasure mm -hmm. to, to be on here with you. So Thank you. here's what I got to ask you. How did you know in 1971 that you should start collecting stuff? Because you ordered, what, was it the Dow was the first thing you ordered? I ordered the Dow when it was uh, being advertised in Black Bell Magazine. Right. Before it came out to the public and to, and to the bookstores. Okay. So I got a pre-publication uh, offer and, and I, ordered, I think... Uh, I asked my mom to pay to write a check for six dollars and ninety five cents. That's what it cost it. <laughs> she wrote a check for me. Yeah. And uh, we sent it in, and of course, I'm anticipating this fantastic book. And uh, and while I was waiting, I asked my mom uh, to get me a, a desk with a lamp, you know. And I'm getting my my pencils and ruler ready and yeah. my notes, and just anticipating this book because I knew it was going to be a so that number one book was that was that your first piece of bruce lee um collection uh no because uh they were they were stuff coming out in the magazines you know right um, right i actually i think uh let me see this this came out in 1974. Mm -hmm. the dow came out in 1975. Mm -hmm. so this this was the bruce lee memorial right this is the heart yeah copy. And then the Dow came out in uh, 75. This is my original Dow, in fact. Wow. I have it in a, in a case now because it's 1975. Right. Know. And, and uh, here, here's, what I, here's what I know. 
you have <laughs> different language copies of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, don't you? Yes, every language that it was printed on. Oh, man. That's Including a... the bootleg ones. <laughs> <laughs> Some people just printed in bootleg right. and... In, uh, into their language. Is there is there anything else that you that you collect uh, memorabilia wise to this extent, or just the Bruce Lee stuff? Uh, basically the Bruce Lee stuff. I'm also a, a World War II buff, but okay. So I, I have books on World War II and, okay. and the whole Holocaust and right Nazi stuff. And but got it. But uh, martial arts is always my my love because I'm I'm also a history buff. But okay, okay, you know. All right. Um, are there any are there any items that you have not yet gotten into your collection that you have your eyes on or, or that you've been looking for? Uh, on Bruce Lee, there's, yeah. there's always there's always something on Bruce Lee that's, <laughs> that's out there, you know. Yeah. Some, so, you know, sometimes the figures, you know, they're so expensive that uh, you wonder if it's, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to spend that kind of money for it. Right. Know, but, yeah. So, but. Uh, you know, I you know I, I basically started with for information on Bruce Lee, you know, and then yes. balloon to this. You yeah, know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, balloon balloon is definitely the word. <laughs> the word for. What about what about clothing, like like the t-shirt stuff or what have you? Do you go crazy on the t-shirts? Not really. Uh, I used to in the old days, but as as now that they come out, so so many of them come out. I I. Uh, I uh, don't collect them as much. Right. But, I, you know, in the old days, you know, when a teacher would come out, it wouldn't be so many teachers all at the same time, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do I do have some stuff from Roots of Fighting, you know, they, they, they've done some nice stuff with the yeah. Jin Fung Kung Fu Institute stuff, you know, so. Yeah. That I like, so I get that. But if it's just a picture of Bruce Lee or something, you know. Right. I, uh, sometimes it depends on what it is, you know. Well, it would depend on if it was a picture of Bruce Lee that you didn't already own. Yes, you know, it depends how, how well did they do it, you know, of a job and a t-shirt. If it's just a regular picture that I have, you know, 100 copies of, yeah. I wouldn't bother getting the t-shirt. I mean, my closet, you know, it's, I have a shelf and it, the t-shirts go to the ceiling, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I, stopped, I stopped buying them. What about, um, what about the, what was it, 1967 Black Belt with the Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate? You own that? Mm -hmm. I do. Okay. And in fact, when it came out, I read the, the article. Uh-huh. Way back then. <laughs> yeah, but you were like, uh, what, seven years so, old or something? <laughs> I was actually studying karate, and my karate teacher brought the Black Belt magazine. And, okay. And I remember all of us opening up, you know, he opened up the, the magazine, and we're all around him looking at yeah. Bruce Lee. Yeah. You know, here we are doing karate, and he says, liberate yourself from classical karate. <laughs> you know. But it, it was a little hard for, for a, young, right. a young kid to understand, but... Yeah. Uh, that's interesting, though, because I, I think that is an example of the influence that Bruce Lee has had on everybody, regardless mm -hmm. of system or style or, or what have you, right? Yeah, he, he was definitely, you know, a great influence because, you know, in the Green Hornet, he was the only one bringing out martial arts mm -hmm. to the public, you know, mm -hmm. and people saw the Green Hornet at that time and they... yeah. You know, they called it karate, you know. Right. So. I, wanted, I wanted to get your... Um, your, your idea on this how come he was able to get that um long street episode how come it, they named it the way to intercept in fist because the writer of the episode was bruce lee's student sterling sillifin ah okay and, and sterling was always trying to get bruce into the industry you know right but it was difficult because he said, you know, obviously you're Asian and we don't know where we can fit you in. You know, <laughs> you know every time they, especially that time, I think they were still, we were still in the Westerns in that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only time you see a, a Asian in the Western was, you know, what, Hop Singh and Bonanza or something. And, uh, yeah. You know, so, so, uh, but Sterling, when he wrote, he, he wanted to put Bruce in something. And, and I think Bruce Lee was a great influence on him and, and, and they started writing this this script yeah. called The Way of the Intercepting Fist. And it was basically tailored for Bruce. Yeah. Even though Francisco was supposed to be the star and it was supposed to be called Long Street, it should have been called Bruce Lee. <laughs> because it was all him. Right. And it's funny because um, we never, at that time, um, I never called him Bruce Lee. I called him Cato at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, even to that day, I never recognized him as Bruce Lee. I recognized him as Cato. Yeah. So when... when uh, when Longstreet was coming out, I uh, I found out 
that Cato was going to be in Longstreet. And I had this small black and white TV with an earphone jack, and I created this, this wiring to put a plug on the jack and put a plug on my cassette recorder. Uh -huh. And I recorded the whole episode on audio cassette. Oh, so you had, yeah. the, you had the first Bruce Lee podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, you know, never in your mind would you think that there would be video, you know, videotapes right. or video disc. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, I recorded this audio of Longstreet. And, and after the episode, I played it over and over and over again, you know, listening okay. to Bruce's words. Right. You know, about, about his, you know, Cantonese Jeet Kune Do and all that. Yeah. You know, so that was, that was pretty cool. So, so let, let me, let's establish the timeline. 71, you're trained in Japanese karate. Correct. 73, you're trained in combat jujitsu with your dad. Uh, yes. Okay. Probably 72, 73, yeah. Okay. 1990, was that your first trip to Los Angeles for, for the, the, the 50th birthday celebration? Yes, because what happened was uh, I had already met i was had already trained with paul vunek okay and and uh and i was i did some training with, with richard bastillo okay and i was always asking them for uh, ted wong right you know right and they all they all told me you know in fact dan too i, I met dan too in the seminar and i and I asked him about ted wong this, they, they gave me the same answer ted wong doesn't, doesn't teach. teach yeah you know so so uh but in the 80s i was writing in fact here it is i was writing this newsletter is that the informer? The Bruce Lee informer, right. What has there happened was. to that? <laughs> well, it was just a newsletter that came out at that time. And, okay. You know. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, we did a few of them. That's very know. cool. That's very cool. Yeah. So I wrote these, and, and then um, Richard Bastillo was in charge of the, of the birthday party uh -huh. for, uh, for Bruce. Yes. So he, he, he invited me as a special guest okay. to the party. Okay to go there so right. that was my first time to california so i so i went there and of course that's where you know uh i met a lot of people mm -hmm. but the, the story is that uh, i got there early and i went to the imb Acam academy uh -huh. to see richard and i'm there probably 20 minutes or so you know and richard's invited me come and train with us and i said oh I'll just you know look at all of because he had all bruce lee's uh a, uh, the heavy bag, yeah. the kicking dummy and all that. Yeah. So I was check, checking all that out. And then walks in uh, Taiwan. Right. You know? Okay. Now, now you got to remember, I, I, I read about Taiwan <laughs> it's here in 1974. Right. And then I read about Taiwan uh, in 1976 with Dan's book. Yes. This is, our, this is a hardback that's, copy of yeah, that's, Daniel Santos' book. That's priceless. Okay, but all right, yeah. so here's what I'm trying to establish. Somewhere, yeah. Here's what I'm trying to establish. Mm -hmm. um, so 73 is combat jujitsu. Mm -hmm. when, when did your focus on Jeet Kune Do training, when did that start and how did it start? Were, did you start doing stuff on your own? Yes, because what happened was when Bruce Lee passed away in 1973. Okay. I was already a Bruce Lee fan, you know. Right. Well, yeah. The the movies came out, and you know, Enter the Dragon was you know sealed it. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am doing karate, and I'm doing jujitsu, and then my friend, uh, who eventually became my brother-in-law, uh, he was doing kung fu. He was one of the few people in the neighborhood that did kung fu, uh -huh. and he did some of the Wing Chun. So, so we started. Uh, we uh, you know we, we all lived in the Bronx, so we right. we had a basement school that where we train okay and kung fu so okay so at that time you know i went to school and i came home and i did karate jujitsu and kung fu mm -hmm. all at the you know in one week i was training in all these different arts mm -hmm. at the same time yeah but uh once i started reading you know um the, once the Tao came out and i started reading bruce lee's philosophy you know break away from traditional arts and so forth and and uh and started understanding more about punching and parrying and things like that. Yeah, I realized that, you know, uh, I needed to break away from the traditional art and try to be more of an alive martial artist. Okay. So, uh, so I started going looking into Jeet Kune Do more and more. You know, mm -hmm. there was 
there, there was some information on Jay Kondo, but not a lot. Right. Those days, you know. Yeah. In 73, you know, whatever you can find, maybe in Black Belt Magazine, then Fighting Stars came out and so forth. Right. So, um, so I started doing that. Uh, then the gym that, uh, that we had with, uh, we were doing Kung Fu, you know, basically everybody, you know, like, like most people, you know, they start training and everybody drops out. Yeah. And I find myself the only one there by myself <laughs> <laughs> training. Yeah. My brother-in-law, my brother-in-law who was teaching the Kung Fu, he, he left to, uh, the military. So I was there on my own, basically mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I started, uh, uh I'm just trying to understand Jet Kundo and I got my cousin who was a, uh, amateur boxer. His name was Miguel Torres. Uh, he was, he used to box mm -hmm. and, uh, and I brought him down and basically, you know, we put on the gloves and started kickboxing and, right. and, and we had the headgear, open headgear, actually the boxer's headgear. Yeah. Uh, and we started kickboxing and, and, and I started, you know, I understood about kicking. I understood about punching from him mm -hmm. uh i understood how to trap mm -hmm. i understood how to grapple you know mm -hmm. throws and so the background was there but uh, the glue to put it all together wasn't you know right yet right so uh but uh you know it kept at it kept at it kept at it and uh kept researching yeah you know a lot of researching and uh and then f uh in the 80s paul vunak was coming into the new york city uh ymca he was teaching every three months or so mm -hmm. he would teach us Saturday and Sunday like for six hour classes mm -hmm. so I never trained with anyone in Jeet Kune Do, so I went over there you know and you know so he obviously you know his Jeet Kune Do concept but um yeah he, w he was more into the street fighting aspect of it which I like yeah so we did that and then like I said I uh, uh eventually I heard about Bastillo mm -hmm. and, and Dan so mm -hmm. I went and saw them but uh, but you know Every ever since I read about Ted Wong, I wanted to meet Ted Wong because I read that he was the only one trained from from scratch. Right, and you got you got that from from the Art and Philosophy book. That's where you read that. Yes. Right. From right here. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I think I have it marked here. You have it marked. <laughs> yeah. Is that Ted Wong? Yeah. Yeah. Ted Wong is the only one trained it's right right yeah. here. Okay. Trained by Bruce Lee from scratch. Uh -huh. You know, we always. We always hear, you know, about Jet Kundo being a stone and you chisel away until you have a statue. Mm -hmm. Whereas Tech One was, uh, was clay and <laughs> made into a statue. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, he yeah. went the other way, the other direction. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I said, this guy, this guy is interesting to train with because he has no preconceived ideas. Right. You know, he just, yeah. whatever Bruce taught him. Right. His mind would not have been full of stuff. Right. That he would have to well, whereas, learn. Uh, correct. Yeah. Like the Kempo guys in the, in yeah. the LA school or yeah. whatever. So I thought uh, he was the guy to try to find, you know? Well, yeah, because, I mean, I, I, I think in that regard, he would probably be a very good reflector, very good mirror mm -hmm. for, for Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. I, I have a sense. I thought of this, uh, you know, I mean, you and I have talked a little bit before in preparation for today's show, but it hit me this morning when I was kind of doing my final research. I think that the relationship between you and Ted Wong is very similar to the relationship between Bruce Lee and Taki Kimura except that Bruce Lee didn't travel to do seminars or what have you. <laughs> but I get a sense that, there, that there's, this, there's, this, there's this closeness, right? Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you usually find between like father and son. Yes, exactly. You know? Exactly. That's how I felt like he was uh, like a father figure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, going back to that story in IBM, when I was there, uh, at Richard Bastille School in 1990, mm -hmm. Ted Wong walks in, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I see him and I say, you know, I've been, I've been searching for you since <laughs> <laughs> the last 14 years or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. and he just smiles, you know, right. wondering who the hell is this guy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I asked him, you know, I asked him, uh, you know, do you teach? And, and, and he says, no, he doesn't teach, you know, so, right. so it's, it's like, uh, it's like the you know the the old story of the the disciple looking for the master, mm -hmm. and once he finds the master, the master says, you know, I don't teach. You right. Know? So you go, oh boy, you know, you made the journey for what, you know. Yeah. But uh, I gave him my phone number, and uh, he gave me his actually too. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And uh, he told me, uh, he called me in, in 93 and told me he was going to Virginia to teach in a camp there, JKD camp. Oh, okay, yeah. That's... And that's where, that was my, so that's where I, I drove all the way over there from New York and yeah. met him then. That's, and from then on, we were just always okay. together. What, what year did he start writing the column in uh, Inside Kung Fu? Do you remember? Uh, I remember seeing it in the 90s. That's for sure. It was the 90s. Mm -hmm. It could have been 92, 91. Okay. What, what happened there is that um, he was writing the column and he had a student, I'm not even going to mention his name, but he had a student who wrote an article and put his name on the article too, Ted Wan's name. Uh -huh. More to honor him, I guess. Mm -hmm. But he wrote the article and he said, you know, Ted Wan's coming now, watch out everybody, you know, the whole thing. And oh, man. It made, it made Ted Wan look bad, you know. Right, yeah. He, he really got a, he really wasn't happy with that, you know. So. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, so uh, he, he, he got a lot of flack for that on the through inside kung fu you know the letters and stuff so he just said you know what i'm not even going to continue this mm -hmm. column and he stopped mm -hmm. the column completely yeah. yeah um he didn't need the he didn't need the politics <laughs> right so what was your what was your first session with him in uh in virginia like oh fantastic <laughs> i mean i mean you, you know uh, here's a guy who's teaching the, the the art the original art as, as taught by bruce Lee. you know yeah. it was it was enlightening to see yeah you know I mean, I, you know, the, the, the other people that I trained with before, it, it was nice, but, you know, I, I was looking for Bruce Lee's art. Yeah. You know, uh, the art that I read in the Tao and saw in the, uh, you know, Bruce Lee's writings and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Ted Wong definitely came mm -hmm. close to that. Well, my, fir my first seminar with him, I, ha I had to look twice because I swear when he moved, he was floating. Mm -hmm. You know, his footwork was amazing. Right? I'd never seen, yeah. I'd never seen anybody move like that, yes. you know? And so I saw him and I go, okay, this, this guy is, um, <clears throat> this is something. Right. Um, so, okay. So, so I, I hope you don't mind if I jump around from era to no. era. Right. Um, tell me about the red boat Wing Chun, um, era for Bruce Lee. Uh, that's when Bruce Lee was in Seattle. Okay. Okay. And uh, when he went to Seattle, he was he was uh, he was training. Uh, Bruce, Bruce Lee's um, see Bruce, Bruce Lee's father had a friend who was a uh, who was a kung fu guy, mm -hmm. and 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 he uh, he was actually the guy who picked up Bruce in uh, in Seattle. Okay. And and uh, his name was Hook Young. And he picked up Bruce, and then he had a he had his own little group, and Bruce started training with him. Okay. In in Seattle. Right. Actually, that's where Bruce Lee learned the praying mantis form and so forth. Okay. So forth. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, so he he trained with him, and and he also learned the red boat Wing Chun from him. So, so that's you know, so Bruce Bruce trained with him for a while, and then after he started getting his own students, he kind of broke away. Mm hmm And uh. And started his own group. Okay, and but it was, it was back in 1959. Okay, and Jesse Glover was the first person to train with him. To to ask Bruce, yeah, yeah for lessons. Okay. You have to understand, Bruce Lee never intended to teach, you know, any type of Wing Chun or Kung Fu. Okay. Uh, when he came to this country, he he thought uh, teaching Cha Cha would make him more money. You know, make him money. <laughs> Never in his mind did he ever think martial arts would make him any type of money, you know? Yeah. So uh, because Jesse approached him to teach, you know, to teach him, then he started teaching and, okay. and that's, you know, got the ball rolling. How much time, but, how much time did you spend with Jesse Glover? Uh, I brought in Jesse uh, for a seminar, I trained with him, but I can't, I, I would never say I'm a Jesse student okay. at all. Okay. Because uh, it was a... Uh, you know, I, I picked up some things from him, but uh, yeah. not not uh, not as a student. You know, when I brought him in as a, for a seminar, we trained together yeah. privately, yeah. and then we trained at the seminar. But uh, it was nice, you know, to see what he uh, what right. he had to teach. You know, yeah. I like his I like his method of chi sao, you know, yeah. with the pressure forward and so forth. But uh, 
Yeah, I would never say I'm right. a Jesse student. So when, when it com when it comes to your you know in your instructor, that's Ted Wong and nobody else, right? I would say so. Yes. Yeah. I would say he's the uh, he's he's the my, see. I would say Ted Wong is my instructor, yes. even though I did train with other people. Yes. You know, and uh, you know, obviously, everyone you interact with kind of uh, uh, influences you in a way. Yeah. Here and there. Yeah. But uh, you can't, you can't say just because they influence you that they they're your instructor, right? You know, you might have just had a well. The, the, la with them. the last time, the last time I saw you live, I think I could be wrong. Um, was no wait, let me think. Were you in Seattle for the thirty fifth anniversary? Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. So okay, so that's where that's where I saw you. But before that because that would have been that would have been what 2008 but i saw you i think in new york in 2005 at an inasano seminar probably yeah right okay yeah. so so my question is because you would go to an inasano seminar for what purpose uh i wanted to see you know, his take on the art. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, it got to the point where he was really leaning towards the Filipino arts mm -hmm. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Which was okay. You know, you, I mean, you know, you could learn some weaponry and so forth. Right. But uh, I was always more into the, the idea of, you know. Yeah. What what did Bruce teach you? And please yes. show me what Bruce teach, yes. taught you. You know no, that kind I, of thing. I I get it. I get it one hundred percent. Right. And I remember <laughs> seeing you there, and I thought that's cool because I knew I knew mm -hmm. who you were, and I knew your background and what have you. Mm -hmm. But I thought it's cool that and and I think that that Ted Wong would probably not have ob objected, right, to your oh, being no. a, exactly, exactly. No, not at all. Right. Yeah. He was very open minded. Mm -hmm. Um. What. Um, you you just mentioned you could learn some weaponry, so I wanted to ask you this, right? Because there is the the let's say there there's the um, the the contention that fencing, boxing, Wing Chun that they form the the base for Jeet Kune Do, right? Mm -hmm. What then would you say is two things: the weaponry approach of Jeet Kune Do and the grappling approach of Jeet Kune Do. And these are connected to some other stuff that I want to uh, get your opinion on. I think everything has to stay within the realm of uh, a realistic street fight. Okay. 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 Not, 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 not the sport right. aspect of it. Okay. Whether it's grappling or whether it's weaponry. Yeah. You know, we can pick up the stick and swing it this way and that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reality, you know, you just got to hit and, <laughs> and, and go in there, you know, or, yeah. or defend and, and hit. You know, and not get too fancy with it. Right. Uh, uh, and the same thing with grappling, you know. I mean, you could only grapple one person at a time. So you have to understand, you know, you're going to try to avoid going to the ground because the person might have friends with him. Mm -hmm. And you may end up getting stomped in the face while you're mm -hmm. putting this guy in a chokehold or something. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it has to stay realistic as far as uh, uh, what you're doing. That's why I always contend that it's not really the style but the tools that you're concerned with. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And the tools, whether it's, it's standing up or, or on the ground or grabbing or not grabbing, you know, right. It's what, it's what you want to refine and, 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 and use in a realistic situation, mm -hmm. not in a sport aspect, you see? So, yeah. So you have to ask yourself, you know, you have to learn and ask yourself, you know, is this for sports or is this for reality of fighting, you know? Yeah. Because sometimes they're different, you know? Yeah. So. Hey, did you teach class last night? Yes. What did you guys work on last night? <laughs> <laughs> what did we work on last night? Yeah. Uh, we worked on uh, shuffling in for kicking and punching. Okay. And, bra and, and bridging the gap. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Um, be so are your classes, um, divided into beginner, intermediate and advanced, or does everybody train together or what? 
Absolutely, just exactly that. Yes. Yeah. First level, second level, third level, but it's beginners, intermediate, and advanced. Okay, so they're separate. It's, it's, it, it's, the three, three different. Okay. Classes. So, 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 how if somebody asks you to um, to differentiate between beginner JKD, intermediate JKD, and advanced JKD, what would you say? Well, as far as the way I teach it, uh huh, yeah. <clears throat> well, the beginners has to learn how to the foundation, the stance, the correct punching, the kicking. Okay. You know, uh, some defense repairing, okay. some blocking. Okay. But uh, when you get to the intermediate, then you have to learn how to put everything in movement, you know, the footwork, the elusiveness of the head, and, uh, you know, moving, mm -hmm. um, how to bridge gap, mm -hmm. learning the different ranges. And I even teach, you know, uh, Immobilizing, trapping, getting in. Right. Uh, the five ways of attack. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and then the, the advanced class is like a, <clears throat> it's like a crazy class. You know? <laughs> it's all about street fighting. I mean, right. It can get a little gory, you know, <laughs> yeah. because it's about the reality of combat, you know. And uh, you opened up, you opened up when? The school? Uh, well, I always taught. Okay. I always, Remember, I told you I had a basement, basement school and so school. forth. Right, yeah. And then I had my garage. Okay. But my garage got filled up too fast. You know, <laughs> word got around. Right. So I had to find a school. So we opened up our, our school in 1994. Okay. So we're going to be... Um, That's 25 years, man. 25 years. Well, congrats on that. Congrats on <laughs> Thank that. Thank you. I mean, because, you know... 25 years, September, yeah, yeah. To keep a school open, right, and this was another thing I wanted to talk to you about, because there is this idea about people commercializing Jeet Kune Do. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so so what have what have been your struggles with that idea and how have you how have you fought <coughs> against the, the 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 idea that you have to sell out in order to be successful at teaching? You don't have to sell out to be successful at teaching. Uh, you just have to, have to know how to run a business. You know? <laughs> Sometimes you could be a good martial artist and a terrible businessman. Right. And vice versa. Well, that's fairly common in Jeet Kune Do, don't you think? Which one? <laughs> that that being, being a good martial artist and a terrible businessman. Uh, yeah, you have to learn. Yeah. I and mean, research too, you know. I mean, even Bruce Lee, he, I mean, he made money teaching his Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. You know, $250 an hour. <laughs> right. Uh, so, you know, people say, oh, Bruce would never commercialize his art. I say, no. no, he just got $250 an hour for it, you know. Yeah. That's why he didn't want to print his $5 books with O'Hara. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the books never got made. As, as a matter of fact, I wanted to ask you about that too, because my business mentor taught that um, it, uh, on the pyramid of influence, right? One of the things that you wanted to have in your repertoire was you wanted to be an author. You wanted to have written, you know, you know a bit, be a published writer, whether it's papers mm -hmm. or a book or whatever. And you wanted to be some kind of lecturer or speaker. Now, confirm for me. Linda Emery met Bruce Lee when he did a lecture at her high school, correct? In Garfield, yes. Right. So, and he published um, Chinese Kung Fu, The Philosophical Art of Self-Defense, when he was, what, 20 years old? Uh, no, uh, the, well, the book came out when he was 23, so he started writing it when he was 22. Okay, All right. Yep. How did he know that you're supposed to, to write and lecture. What do you think? Um, I think I think he 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 enjoyed being different. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he was this he was this uh, young guy from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to understand. Back in the sixties, not too many people knew what about the about Asia. Right. Know? Yeah. It was like the mysterious <laughs> <laughs> world. You know. Yes. Yes. So here's this young guy from Hong Kong who's going to lecture about, you know, yin and yang and, and about uh, philosophy and so forth, you know. The, the writing part, uh, I think, came about because uh, he met James, James Lee. Okay. And James Lee had his own publishing company. Right. And uh, as soon as James met Bruce, he knew, mm -hmm. this guy's got something to offer. Let's write a book, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they wrote the book. Yeah. Which, which helped Bruce a lot, I mean, financially. Yeah. Because it, it sold pretty well, right? It sold very well. 
Well, why do you think? So what, what do you? Why do you think that was? Because of the exotic nature of having a book on Chinese martial art in the sixties. Uh, probably. I mean, James, James Lee was also a good businessman. You know, the first two books that he wrote was called Karate Kung Fu. Okay. With the big K. Yes. Yes. You know, uh, nobody called it Kung Fu. Everybody called it Gung Fu. And James Lee was the one that started that K, Kung Fu, you know? Okay. So he's the guy that actually named it that. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, Bruce Lee, uh, you know, he, when he met James, he, you know, James saw this guy had something to offer. Let's, let's, let's write this book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he advertised it well. He advertised it in all his books. And, you know, you look at the, the karate kung fu books in the back is it has an advertisement for the bruce lee's chinese kung fu book yeah so you know again it's this mysterious thing you know chinese kung fu the philosophical art of self-defense yeah what could this be you know yeah so you send your 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 money and get it you know and see what it's all about back at back in the old days did you make use of the wing chun book of james lee's wing chun book in your training actually uh it's funny because uh I bought that book because mm -hmm. I knew Bruce Lee's, you know, researching Bruce. I knew he did Wing Chun. Right. So I I bought the the Green Book way back in the seventies, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that James Lee was Bruce Lee's student. Oh. So I'm reading the. I'm you know first of you know as soon as you get a book, the first thing you do is go through all the pictures. Right. And when I get to the back of it, I see. Somebody that looks like Bruce <laughs> with the with the right. wooden dummy, you know. Right. They never showed his face, only his back. Yeah. And I said, "This is Bruce Lee." Uh huh. You know. So yeah. then I went to the front and started reading yeah. about the author, and I realized, "Holy cow! This guy, the author of this book, trained with Bruce Lee." Yeah. You know, at that time I still didn't didn't know the, all the history of Bruce Lee, so I didn't know who James Lee was. Or okay. The yeah. whole thing, you know. So so I was surprised that the every book that I had basically was written by a Bruce Lee student. Right. Because I don't Lee. think I don't think the, the early editions of that book had on the cover no, technical edited, editor. No. <laughs> I have the original one. Right. Just... I, I do too. Yeah. Yeah. Because that book is where I first learned Paksa. That's where I got it from. Yeah. Uh, Paksa and reference point trapping was really nice in the back too. Yeah. 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 But uh uh, you also saw the the deflecting, the parrying, the mm -hmm. was, just the pictures could say a lot. You know, you look at that and you, you know, and you see them doing this instead of this, and you yes. say, "Whoa, yeah, I came from this, yeah, but I like I like this, you know." <laughs> <laughs> and then you see them doing this, exactly. you know, and you're telling yourself, "Whoa, yep, you know, we yep. learn this and this." Yep. So I mean, obviously, you know, it, it was a good foundation as a as a as a kid learning karate because it, it taught you a lot. Yeah. But then you know you have to evolve and grow and. Did you and did you have so guys on. did you have guys from other styles of other arts coming over to the basement or the or, or the garage? Uh, I think at that time maybe one or two. Okay. But when they saw the art. I mean, even in my school, I get people to tell me, you know, I learned more from you in one week than I learned three years in this school, you know, in mm -hmm. another school. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what to say, you know, just, well, well, you know, it's the reality of combat. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I remember in the early days of seminars, people saying that, that Jeet Kune Do was like university level martial arts. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't grade school or, or high school or whatever. Right. Jeet Kune Do was, yeah. was, was, um, was, you know, was that level. So, um, what about training with uh, the Kimuras in Seattle? Uh, yeah, with Taki and Andrew. Very nice people. Boy. Yeah. Very humble people. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, when I, when I went to the first uh, Nucleus seminar in 97, I believe it was, um, mm -hmm. January of 97, mm -hmm. uh, I said, well, if I'm going to be in the West Coast, I'm going to Seattle because I got to visit the Great Side because right. I'd never visited the Great Side. You know? Oh, okay. <clears throat> so when I was there, when I was, it was in San Francisco. When we were in San Francisco, I saw Taki. And I said, Taki, I'm going to go to Seattle to visit the Great Side. Mm -hmm. You know, after the seminar, we're mm -hmm. going to, I'm going to fly over there. And he said, well, when you fly there, call me. Let me know where you are. I'll pick you up at the hotel. That I didn't expect. Yeah. So sure enough, you know, when I when I went to Seattle, I called him up. He came in his car, picked me up, 
took me to all the different places where Bruce Lee has schools, yeah. Chinatown, show me where Bruce and Linda got married, the chapel. Yeah. And then took me to the to the cemetery. That's sweet. In fact, I think I even have some I have some videos of that <laughs> yeah. of him talking to me there. Yeah. And I, so he really, really showed me all around. And then um and then uh he he took me back to the hotel and invited me to to the, his class mm -hmm. in the basement of the shop right supermarket mm -hmm. hand. So it was like a secret <laughs> entrance, no right. sign or anything. Right. Did you he gave me the address? Did you, did you ever encounter Michael Lee in in uh, in Seattle? Never did. No. No. Yeah, no. I I I encountered him. I heard he was really good too. I encountered him in 1980 in Seattle. No. Yeah. Uh huh. Because I was in Je I was Jesse's in, brother. Yes. Yeah. I was in Seattle for 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 a couple of months, and um, I and I I only made it to him. I didn't I didn't have the chance to make it to to Taki's place. But yeah, oh, okay. yeah, it, it was, it just blew my mind, you know, the stuff that he was doing. Um, I would love to say that it all made sense and I got it, you know, instantly, <laughs> but that's not, that's not really true. Um, mm -hmm. Would you, would you be able to say in one word the influence that Ted Wong had on you? One word, yeah, <laughs> of, of the influence, yeah. Uh, probably research. Okay. Research, research, and research. I got and that's three, but <laughs> yeah, you know. In other words, uh, don't take somebody's word for it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to learn Bruce Lee's art, learn what Bruce Lee wrote about the art. Yeah, because obviously you can't train with Bruce but you can train with people who train with Bruce or at least the next generation and so forth yeah and you want to make sure that they they're still you know in the right path yeah so uh if somebody's giving you something that doesn't jive with what Bruce Lee was teaching you know it should pop out it, is, pop is that, like that. Is, is that what you would say then it's this whole thing about people talking about your Jeet Kune Do, right and, and my Jeet Kune Do and, and this. What, what do you think, what do they mean by that? Well, you know, you first have to learn the total art. Mm -hmm. You have to learn the total art. And then you have to see, you know, as a teacher, you have to teach the total art. Let's put it that way. Okay. Not, not your preferences, which right. is a mistake a lot of people are doing now. They're teaching their preferences. Yeah. And then their students only learn their preferences. You know? Yeah. You have to learn the total art because when you learn the total art, then the person can see what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. You know, one guy can kick high, another guy cannot, you know. Mm -hmm. One guy can footwork like Ted Wong, another one cannot, you know. I mean, right. It's just too heavy or whatever. Right. You know, so, so, so they themselves are going to have their own style of what they can express from Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. See? Yeah. In other words, it's like it's like you're like a like a teacher teaching you how to write script. You know. Mm -hmm. She teaches you the proper way of doing the A. Yes. Proper way of doing the B. Proper yes. Way, and she'll mark you wrong <laughs> X or, or check right. Yeah. But eventually, when you write your own, um, your own, you when you have your signature, you you don't have your teacher's signature. You have your own signature. Right. But your signature has to stay within the structure of the alphabet that was taught to you for people to read what you're writing. Mm -hmm. If you just express it, you know, yes. whatever, nobody's going to understand what you're writing there. Right. Because you left the framework of what was taught to you as expressing how to write. See? So in Jeet Kune Do is the same thing. Yeah. You know, you have the, you have the art. I wanted to ask and, you about that. Mm -hmm. Define for me the art of Jeet Kune Do the philosophy of Jeet Kune Do and the science of Jeet Kune Do. Well, the science is ex the body expressing the art correctly. Okay. You know, uh, to, to its maximum. Okay. You know, we have two arms and two legs. Let's learn how to use them to the maximum. Okay. According to Bruce Lee. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so that's the, that's the science. In other words, there is a, a correct science of punching, correct science of kicking, you know, that, that, that the human body can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Uh, uh, art is uh, anything done to a masterful way. It's 
considered art, you know? Mm -hmm. Artistic is anything done correctly to the highest, highest level. Right. You know, martial art, dancing can be an art. Right. You know, anything you do can be an art, you know? Yeah, yeah. That if, if you bring it to that highest level. Okay. Okay. The philosophy of, of Jeet Kune Do is to teach you to uh, liberate yourself uh, from from tradition and not, and not accept tradition for what it is, you know, just understand that you you have to, it, it has nothing to do with uh, with culture, with tradition, but it has everything to do with the the science of the body mm -hmm. expressing martial arts. You know, is, you know, like for example, when you swim, there's no Chinese way of swimming or Japanese way of swimming. Right. Or American way of swimming. Right. You know, it's the only the human way of swimming. Right. You know? Yeah. You know, it's only in martial arts where we have all these different ways of, of, of fighting from cultures, you know. But in reality, when you're trying to defend yourself, you'll see how fast <laughs> the body just goes on. So um, does, fight or flight. Does, does Jeet Kune Do then teach, when it comes to what you just said, there's no Chinese way of swimming. There's no Korean way of swimming. There's no Japanese way of swimming. Everybody, when they compete at the Olympics, they're just swimming. Do you think, mm -hmm. you think, Jeet Kune Do is different than from other martial art methods because that kind of teaching is built in to Jeet Kune Do, but it might not be built into a, a Japanese karate system. Uh, I think if well, if you're talking about Japanese karate system, you know, it's it's the founder said this is the way it's going to be done, mm -hmm. and everybody strictly follows it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, who 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 created the kata? You know, right man-made right yeah yeah he said we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this and that's he on one then he on two is gonna be this and then <laughs> that's he on two let's take pictures of it write it down <laughs> it's the law yeah. you know yeah. and, and and you know and uh and now you want to get to you know purple belt you have to learn he on six and you know but it, it's, it's basically man-made if you look at it yeah whereas bruce was trying to say you know uh, it's, it's, it's not about tradition or it's not about culture. It's not about style. It's mm -hmm. about how does one human being express himself honestly in a situation where he has to defend right. himself to survive. Right. You know? if, there, if there was, you know, because I, I, would, I would hate to ask you for, like, you know, the one thing or your favorite thing because that imagine me asking you what your what your your favorite <laughs> your favorite what's your favorite piece in your collection i know there there there's like a <laughs> hundred favorites right but um what is oh i i, I just remembered this i went to your website what's mm -hmm. the music there's like a bruce lee rap song on your website what is that we discovered that song we use it for uh jumping rope in our school and i said you know what let's put that on the website <laughs> you like it <laughs> i love it I love yeah, it. yeah 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 we use yeah. Uh, we use the, the the soundtrack from um from from enter the dragon okay right? well this is a little from enter the dragon but it's a little yeah faster pace now do you know? okay now you might be old enough to, do you know of um, uh, uh, Dennis Coffey and the Detroit Guitar Band that he did the uh, uh, the theme from Enter the Dragon. He did like a like a, a, a guitar funk version of it. Hmm. Do you when? know that music? This would have been in the seventies. Mm, probably, I don't know. Okay, I'll send. I'll send I mean, to... I I have I have I have a uh, CDs from a Japanese band that's hard rock, and they did Enter the Dragon. No right? way. It's just it blows you away. <laughs> I mean, they they go all out. It's really really nice. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah, so. I'll I'll will send you I'll send you because he did he did um he did the theme from Black Belt Jones with Jim okay. Kelly also right and he did he did a a, a theme from um from uh, from uh Enter the Dragon yeah okay um here's a question for you had Bruce Lee not died. Give me mm -hmm. an idea of one thing that you think, the way things might have evolved, the way things might have developed. Have you ever thought on that? A lot. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I don't think you and I would be here right now. 
talking well, in a podcast. Okay, what would we be doing? Because I don't think Bruce Lee would have continued with the Jeet Kune Do as far as um, teaching it publicly. Okay. I think he would have kept it to himself. So uh, I don't think Dan would have been teaching or, or Ted Wong or so, the students would have. So you and I would have moved to L.A.? <laughs> to L.A. to meet Bruce? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Bruce, Bruce would have been, uh, I think he would have been directing and producing movies with philosophical themes, you know. Right. But what I'm saying is if, if we heard that he was doing that, but Inosano was teaching in Chinatown, right, you know, semi-privately, you and I would have moved, right, to find the place. Yeah, I mean, it would have been, it would have been uh, something to see what Bruce Lee would have done next after Into the Dragon. Yeah. Because obviously there would have been a lot of people searching for Jeet Kune Do after Into the Dragon. Yeah. And, uh, and now they're asking, you know, where yeah. do we learn this? You know, so now he has to make a decision. Do you remember, teach it? Do you remember um, when you first saw The Big Boss? Sure. How, what, was, what, was the, what was the reaction of the crowd? Oh, everybody's <laughs> going crazy. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, R Run Run Shaw, he, he, he knew that uh, Raymond Chow and Bruce were going to release The Big Boss in America. So he ran and he released The Five Fingers of Death first. Right. Try to beat them to it. You know? Right, yeah. And The Five Fingers of Death, I think, stayed in the movie theaters like for a month or so. Mm -hmm. They never took it down because everybody went to see this. Again, Asian thing. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what the heck it was, you know. So Yeah. So, you know, America wasn't familiar with China yet, you know, and... and what was going on. So when they saw this Kung Fu, you know, they, they went crazy. Yeah. So then uh, Bruce came out. And again, when I went to see it, I wanted to see Kato in the movies. Now, you know? <laughs> and you see him in the big boss and you say, wow. Yeah. And it was great because I think uh, two weeks later, the Fist of Fury came out. Now. It was called the Chinese Connection here. Oh, but, that I soon? Mean, they, yeah. They didn't even give us a break. <laughs> you know? Wow. It came out. Right away. Yeah. So, like, I mean, we were just getting inundated with Bruce, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so we got the Fist of Fury. Why was Bruce then, Lee so popular in, like, Brooklyn and the Bronx and what have you, among, among you guys? I think, uh, you know, uh, like they said, you know, Bruce Lee put balls in, into the Chinese, you know, in <laughs> balls to the Chinese. I think he saw someone that you normally didn't see. Right. In the movies, as a tough guy, uh, you know, okay. we were always accustomed to seeing the, you know, the John Waynes and the, yeah. you know, the Burt Lancaster and the Clean Eastwoods. Yeah. Here's this Chinese guy who you think, you know, uh, how, how could he be a star ever, mm -hmm. you know, and now you see him as, as not just a star, right, but someone who can kick some butt, you know, <laughs> and you say to yourself, wow, look at this. Yeah. So. You know, it, it kind of gave a lot of people hope, you know, if if he can do something like this, you know, maybe you can achieve something yeah. with greatness too, you know. Um, did did you guys have, <clears throat> like, all of the, 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 the Wang Yu films, like the One-Armed Swordsman and all that stuff? <clears throat> yeah, th those came out in the 70s also. Right, you know? okay. Because... We couldn't get enough of those things, you know. Yeah, those movies. no. Okay, so, so I'll tell you what happened to me, and you tell me if something similar happened to you. When in The Big Boss, his jade pendant gets broken mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's now free to fight. The second that he moved, I was like, whoa, this guy doesn't fight like other Chinese Kung Fu people. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? Right away. Yep. I mean, it was just a one hit, right. one knockout. Right. Yeah. You know? And you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because... Uh, Bruce Lee had a had a confrontation with the first director of the Big Boss mm -hmm. because the first director of the Big Boss wanted him to do a long out fight right. from the, from the get go. Yeah, and Bruce said, "No, I want to just kick the guy. He falls things out." Mm -hmm. And you know, and the directors arguing with Bruce. You know, <laughs> you do whatever I you do what I tell you to do. You know. Yeah. I guess he didn't realize who he was talking to. But that's a testament to Bruce Lee's self-confidence, isn't it? Because he wasn't a name yet. 
yeah. in, in Asia. Well, but Raymond Chow knew what he, who he had. Oh, you know what? Let me ask you this, because you, you'll be the guy to confirm this. I heard a story that they were in, like, the viewing studio at Golden Harvest, right? Mm -hmm. And Raymond Chow showed Bruce Lee whatever um, Golden Harvest movie was the top grosser. And mm -hmm. Bruce Lee says, that's your best film? And Raymond Chow says, yes. And Bruce Lee says, I can do better. I can do better, yes. Is that that's true? true? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wow. And Raymond Chow said, I'm, I don't doubt him. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Bruce knew, you know, what he could do. Yeah. I mean, he, he wasn't just, he, he, was, he was coming off, you know, Cato, the Green Hornet, mm -hmm. you know, Longstreet, mm -hmm. Marlowe, mm -hmm. Ironside, you know. So he had already done stuff in front of the screen. So he, he knew what he could do. Right. You know, if he was given the chance, you know, everybody in America is blind. They can't see that this guy. Yeah has something to offer. Yeah. So when Raymond Child, you know, saw him, you know, uh, and, and he told him that he could do this, you know, mm -hmm. he believed it. I mean, the, the only reason Raymond Child knew of Bruce was because Bruce did a demonstration on Hong Kong TV. Right. He, he was there. You see, Bruce went, Bruce went to Hong Kong to help his mother and his brother paperwork Move to come over. to America. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, and he's on the plane and he sees all these reporters out there. He doesn't know, you know, he, he, he's, he's with Brandon, you know, yeah. with Brandon. So they were going to take a trip to see the, the family. Yeah. And, and, and fix all this paperwork. And when he sees all these reporters, he's thinking, you know, uh, there must be somebody important in, uh, <laughs> in this plane, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not realizing they were all there for him. Yeah. Because the, the Green Hornet was showing in Hong Kong as the Cato show, you know. Right. Yeah. So he was invited. He was invited to these to these uh, talk shows, night talk shows. And, and that's where you see him demonstrating his Jet Kune Do. Okay. You know? Yeah. And, and from, that, from that show, you know, low, low, actually Low Wei's son saw it and he told Low Wei about it. And Low Wei saw it and he told Raymond Chow about it. And Raymond Chow saw it and said, let's get this let's guy. Get <laughs> <you know? clears throat> right. And, uh, and uh, basically, but going back to the big boss, Bruce Lee just wanted to do that one hit and the guy gets knocked out, and the director's fighting with him. You know, the guy who plays the big boss in the big boss, mm -hmm. the Chinese guy, is actually the fight choreographer of the movie. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, he wasn't going to argue with Bruce. What Bruce wanted, he was going to get. But the director said, no, you're going to do this long after. Yeah. So, you know, Bruce gets on the phone and gets him fired. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> he calls Raymond Chow and gets him fired. Since we're talking and about... Low weight comes in. We're talking about Bruce Lee movies. Um, have you ever spoken or corresponded with Bay Logan? I met Bay Logan in Hong Kong. I was going to ask yeah. you if you, you see, I, that was going to be one of my questions, but I thought. You didn't see my pictures with Bay Logan, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't find those. You got too many, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went, when I went to Hong Kong with my student, uh, uh, we, we went to see Bay Logan. Okay. Yeah, so we, we visited him over there and yeah, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. Nice oh, guy. Yeah, okay. All right. Look, so since, since we're talking about people that you've met, but if you guys have not, gone on the YouTube and seen um, Sifu Richard's interviews with Charles Damiano, you gotta get, you gotta, I'll put a link to them in, in, in uh, the description here, but incredible, incredible. I love watching those shows, man. That, that was, that was, <laughs> that was sweet, right? Um, what's, a, what's a misconception about Jeet Kune Do that annoys you? That Bruce Lee took a little bit of this, a little bit of that, <laughs> and created Jet Kundo. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. bit of the best of this style, the best of that style, right. the best of that style, and yeah. created Jet Kundo. You know, last That's night. That's not how it worked. Last <laughs> night we, we, we were in class, and I, was, and I was telling my students, I go, look, there are so many messages that you can get from just watching Bruce Lee. I go, when Bruce Lee kicks, does he look like he knows how to kick? Yes. When he punches, does he look like he knows how to? Punch? When he picks up the staff, right in in where the picks dragon, it up really cool. right or yeah. does he look like he knows how to? Use? When he picks up the double stick and enter the dragon, when he picks up the nunchaku, does he look like he knows what he's doing? And when he grapples with the hapkido master in Game of Death, does mm -hmm. he look like he knows what he's doing? I go absolutely. That's the message. Yeah. 
train, mm -hmm. train and he, become well, proficient. He understood the root, you know. Mm -hmm. That's why he would say, if you understand the root, you understand all the blossomings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, you understand the root of, of uh, how the, the hands move. I mean, you look at Bruce with the bow staff and Enter the Dragon. I never heard anyone say, that's not the way you use a bow staff, you know. Right. Yeah. New Chucks, same thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you ask yourself, who, who taught Bruce Lee the bow staff? Who taught him the New Chucks? Who taught him the knife fighting in, the, in Big, the big boss. boss? Yeah. No, he understood the root. Yeah. And we understood the root. He understood how to use the weapon. You know? Hey, is it is it And that's very important. Is it okay is it okay if um if I steal, you know, because he uses the double knife in, in the big boss, right? So mm -hmm. is it okay if I steal that and go, Hey look, that's Kali. <laughs> is it Kali? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Um, you okay, get a guy. So, you get a guy from Harlem, and he goes, "Hey, that's Harlem fighting." You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Think about that. So, one. okay. So I want, um, I want to get your definitions on these phrases, right? Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll mention the phrase, and you give me your definition. So your definition on modified Wing Chun. What's modified Wing Chun? I think when Bruce Lee came to America, he found out that. The Wing Chun that he was using in Hong Kong worked for the average Asian person in mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Okay. And then when he went to America, especially in Seattle, and he met the six foot, 220 pound man, he probably said, you know, I'm going to have to alter this a little bit because uh, it's not the same as uh, right. meeting, a, you know, a short guy more my size, you know, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know, his size. Okay. And, and they were even plain and he can easily... You know, do whatever he had to do. Okay. So he had to modify it a bit so that uh, it could work, you know, for him. Okay. That assailant. Do you think it's necessary for JKD people to go into Wing Chun in order to understand JKD? No. They don't have to go to Wing Chun the style. Okay. But they should learn the aspects or the elements of Wing Chun that's in Jae Kune Do. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know people that say, oh, you don't have to trap. Why should I trap when I can punch? Or why should I trap when I can finger jab? But, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you might need. You know, if you're talking about ranges, right. you know, long, medium, close range, yeah. and you got obstacles in the way, you got to take those obstacles out of the way, you know? Yeah. If not, you're going to end up pulling back and going, trying to go in again. Okay. All right. You see? Yeah. So you have to learn how to immobilize. Okay. Let's go back to definitions. Your definition of non-classical Chinese Kung Fu. Non-classical Chinese Kung Fu. Yeah. Well, if it's non-classical, it is a Chinese Kung Fu. It's like a yin and yang there. Isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah. It would be yin and yang because if it's Chinese Kung Fu, but it's non-classical Chinese Kung Fu, you know. It's funny because Bruce... You know, he always had a problem with naming what he was doing because he was progressing so quickly. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, from 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 uh, uh, from Wing Chun, you know, he, you know, he had to, he had to change it to the Jung Fang method. Right. You know. Okay. So that, that was Fang the method he went to. <clears throat> that was the next definition I wanted you to give. Jun Fang Gung Fu. What's the definition of that? Uh, well, Bruce Lee actually called it the Jung Fang method. Okay. That's what he called it, the Jung Fang Method. Yeah. Jung Fang Kung Fu was the name of the school, Jung Fang Kung Fu Institute. Okay. <clears throat> and in the Jung Fang Kung Fu Institute, he taught the Jung Fang Method. Okay. The Jung Fang Method basically was, well, the reason he, he called it that is because when he went to Seattle in 59, he was doing the Wing Chun, mm -hmm. eventually modifying it a bit. Mm -hmm. But now he started looking into other Kung Fu arts. Because Bruce Lee wanted to be the best Kung Fu man out there, you know, or yeah. Kung Fu, as he said. Yeah. He would take trips to Vancouver, Canada, which was right across from Seattle. Mm -hmm. And they had a Chinatown there. He would buy all these Chinese books on, on Kung Fu, which you probably could see them always auctioned off, at, you know, all these different books. Right. But um, so, so he would take, you know, the, some of the stuff that he learned from those books and, and implement it into his art. Eventually... 
it didn't look specifically just like Wing Chun anymore, you know. It, so he just called it, you know, the Jung Fang method. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in the Jung Fang method, there was a little bit of a judo throw here and there too. Right. He learned that too in yeah. Seattle, you know. Yeah. He always he loved the Osotogari. Everywhere, all the notes that I have, you know, you see the Osoto, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> It's a good throw. Okay. You know? uh, definition of Jeet Kune Do concepts. Concepts or Jeet Kune Do? No, Jeet Kune Do <laughs> concepts. We're get, we're, I'm saving that one for last. <clears throat> well, Bruce Lee never used the word Jeet Kune Do concepts. You know, he, it, it was something that Dan came with, mm-hmm. you know, came up with because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when, when Dan opened up his Filipino Cali Academy, he, he taught Filipino martial arts and the Jeet Kune Do was taught separately uh, at a, basically a, a not a secret class, but a, a class that was only for specific yeah. uh, students. Yeah. But uh, but he says, you know, as, as he was teaching Jeet Kune Do and teaching Filipino, he saw a lot of similarities to eventually he kind of coupled both together. Mm-hmm. And he didn't like the idea of there being an exclusive Jeet Kune Do group, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, so he, 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 the, the way he saw, you know, with the Filipino that he, he did other, you know, he started adding other arts, you know, the Thai boxing, the savat, right. the shoot wrestling. Right. And he started using the, the, the way Jeet Kune Do was as a live art into these styles. And he basically called it the Jeet Kune Do concepts. Okay. You know, what happens is that he called, he called that philosophy Jeet Kune Do concepts. That's why a lot of the students say Jeet Kune Do didn't exist. It was just a philosophy. Yeah. And then he called Bruce Lee's art. He went back and named it to what it was before. Yeah. <laughs> he called it the Jung Fang, you know. So he called it the Jung Fang trapping, Jung Fang boxing, Jung Fang right. boxing. Yeah. And that was Dan that, that went back and renamed the Jung Fang and he called what he did with the other arts, Jeet Kune Do concepts. Okay. Uh, definition of Jun Fang Jeet Kune Do. Jung Fang Jeet Kune Do basically uh, was named by the nucleus, actually Shannon with a uh, uh, suggested it mm-hmm. is Jung Fang is Bruce Lee's name mm-hmm. uh, so it's just it just means Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do okay. to differentiate it from um, the Jeet Kune Do concepts that existed at that time okay um, mm-hmm. everywhere that almost everywhere that I see the date assigned to Jeet Kune Do is 1967 mm-hmm. but there's I should have I should have uh, I can't put my hands on it, but there's a sign that, and I, oh man, I, sh- I should know what the sign says, but next to Bruce Lee's name on it, the date given is 1966. Mm-hmm. Do you know the, do you know the, do you know the sign I'm talking about? Yeah, it's, 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 it's off. <laughs> uh, it was a sign that was hanging up in the Filipino County Academy. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's off. All right. The date is off. Okay. It, it is. It is 1967. Actually, Bruce Lee used the name, uh, the way of the stopping fist or the way of the intercepting fist, in January of 67. Okay. But he wrote it in Chinese. Right. And then, then in um, in June of 67, July 67 was when he actually called it Jeet Kune Do. Okay. But before. Jeet Kune Do, it was called the Tao of Jeet Kune. Right. Not too many people know that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you, if you translate the Tao of Jeet Kune, it means the way, the way of stopping fist. Yes. Or the way of intercepting fist. Yes. So the Tao of was at the beginning. Right. The Tao of Jeet Kune. So why did he add, I mean, what's better known as a Japanese word to the mm-hmm. end of the of of a Chinese name, because and this is <laughs> what happened was he was going to be interviewed by Black Belt Magazine the very next day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at his look 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 at his date timer and you'll see it. Yeah, you know, Jikundo, and then the next day interviewed by you know <laughs> Max Paul Arnold. <laughs> so so this was it. This this was his 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 moment. Right. You know, yeah. This was his moment. You know, uh, he was going to tell everyone what the name of his art is. Okay. And he he wrestled with it because he said, you know, calling it the Tao Jikun is not exactly a 
a ringer, you know, a nice name. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have Taekwondo. Taekwondo, you have Aikido, mm -hmm. Karate Do, mm -hmm. Kendo, mm -hmm. you know, Subak Do, <laughs> Tansu Do. <laughs> Jeet Kune Do sounds a lot better than <laughs> Dao Jeet Kune. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Sure. Okay. I, I, I think, also, I think, I think John Reed probably influenced him too, because John Reed did the Taekwondo, you know? Right, yeah. And I think Bruce Lee said, you know what? I'm just going to call it Jeet Kune Do instead of Dao Jeet Kune. Yeah. And that's when he named it. So and saying, then the next day he got interviewed. So you're saying the, he, he, was a, he, he was a marketer. He was a businessman. Well, he, he knew what sounds good and what sounds bad, you know? <laughs> I mean, imagine, imagine, you know, he knows karate people are going to be reading this article. Imagine right. them reading this article and saying, the Dao Jeet Kune, what the hell is that, you know? <laughs> You yeah, know? Dao What tells? What's that? What's what's your art? Yeah, my art is the Dao Jikun. You know, That's, what? Um, so Jikun does sound a lot better. No, it does. <laughs> it does for sure. What? Um, what are some of the most, other than the Dao, what are some of the most important martial art books on your bookshelf? Other than the Dao? Yeah. <laughs> I like. Um, I don't know. I can't. It all relates to Jeet Kune Do, all of them. The fighting okay. method, Bruce Lee's fighting method, uh, Dan's book okay. on the art and philosophy of Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. I think all the historical books on Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. I mean, when it comes to martial arts, uh, I think those are, you know, anything that has to do with Jeet Kune Do and Bruce Lee are very important to me. I mean, my, my first martial art book was a karate book by Nishiyama, you know, the, the one he's doing, The Flying Sidekick. It was a karate uh -huh. It was a karate book, it was, you know, Japanese, hardbound. Yeah. But uh, once Jeet Kune Do came around, you know, <laughs> I absorbed all that stuff you right. know, that as, it, it. as it comes in, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What, so that's what I like. What about uh, the most important non-martial art book on your bookshelf? The most important non-martial art book in my Books in my yeah. See, see, I, like I want to make it easy for you. I don't want you to pick just one. Give me like a few, a few titles. Well, I like Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. Ah, because it's a, it's a good motivate. I was just talking about book. that on on the other podcast on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. You know that everybody gets Bruce Lee the you know the thumbs up with that chief fame thing, but it's actually Napoleon Hill who right. who wrote that. You know. Yes. <laughs> so that's that's a good uh, motivational book. Okay. You know, so I like that. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, I, I like uh, philosophical books too. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have uh, books on by Krishna Murthy. Okay. Uh, Think on these things. I think is a great book. Yeah. You know, I, actually, uh, I have uh, Benjamin Franklin's philosophy book. Few people know that Benjamin Franklin was a philosopher. Right. You know, the, the Poor Rich's Almanac. Yeah. And and that's a fantastic book. Yeah. It's really, really good. <laughs> you know, he's the one that said a penny saved is a penny earned, you know? <laughs> did, did, you come, did you come to, to an appreciation for stuff like that through Bruce Lee and Jeet Kune Do, or did, they, did it happen separately? I think uh, Bruce Lee made me appreciate uh, the value of researching mm -hmm. and reading and self-knowledge, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, how, on, on how much you can really, really absorb if you give 200% to it, you know? Right. So when I want to learn about a subject, I go 200% on it, you know, yeah. no matter what the subject is. I mean, I did that with religion, with nutrition, mm -hmm. and I think it all, you know, it, it enlightened me in those subjects, so. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with all of the divisiveness that there is in in Jeet Kune Do, right mm -hmm. um so this this is a self-serving question but not for me for you because there was a guy who commented that you are a worthy successor to ted wong <laughs> okay thank you so the people who think that you're cool <laughs> tell me why they think you're cool I guess because I honestly express myself. <laughs> what can I say? Okay. I'm just me. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, 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 I try not to be, you know, uh, I, I try to be myself and, and not uh, 
not just a show, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. The reality. Like I said in the beginning, I think I think your sincerity is the thing that comes out, right? You mm -hmm. know, you've never you. I, I I don't think that you try to pass yourself off as, you know, the guy, right? Or or what have you. You just you you just present yourself as you are. Mm -hmm. You know, um, is there a is there a realization? that you've experienced in Jeet Kune Do that it seems to you not very many other people have experienced that realization? Um, I've seen things in Bruce Lee's writings that actually teach, but I don't see too many people teaching. Is that where you're headed? Okay, I mean, no you, I mean, you tell, no, you tell me what comes to mind. Actually, th there was a second part to that. Yes. Is there just like a general realization about Jeet Kune Do, and it seems to you that not that many people have picked up on it, but also then, are there any unique innovations in the training or the teaching that you came up with independent from, you know, and anybody who was that you that you spent time with or even from Ted Wong or anything? Um, I think uh, when you have the tools, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, one thing about a teacher is that you have to learn how to teach the tools. Yeah. You know, that's why, you know, not all martial artists make good teachers, you know, or right. vice versa. Yeah. You have to have a good teacher who's not a great martial artist, but he can teach you a lot. Yeah. You know, uh, but I think uh, uh, innovation as far as uh, how to teach or get, a, or get a point across with drills and so forth mm -hmm. has, always, has always been there, you know, and, and it's something that I, I come up with, I try to come up with to get the point across to the students, mm -hmm. you know, uh, on how to appreciate what they're being taught, mm -hmm. you know, or, or how to develop the certain, certain tools, certain kicks, certain points and so forth yeah. and why they're doing it, you see. How, so, how, so as far as drill is concerned, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's constantly innovating. How long has your most senior guy been with you? <clears throat> Let me see. The school's been open close to 25 years, I think. Uh, I have a student actually that started with me in the garage. So he's been with me longer than 25 years. Okay. Why? why? And, my, and, my, and my son. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, he doesn't have a choice, <laughs> right? Good-looking kid too. I gotta tell you, <laughs> thank kid. you. Yeah, he got he got asked to be in the Bachelor, believe it or not. Oh, He's out in California. No yeah. way. But he turned it he turned it down. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> um, what have you done? Any movie stuff? Movies? Yeah. Behind the scenes Nothing stuff to brag or anything? About. No. Okay. I, I one time we I did I. I we, we tried something with, uh, with Ty Mac, you know, the guy who did the... Uh, uh -huh. The Last like Dragon. dragon. Yeah. Uh, the Last Dragon, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. But it didn't... It, it, the, we did a few scenes and then it didn't... Okay. The producers pulled out and all that, so... Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> what... Um, the guy who's been with you since forever, <laughs> why is he still there? Now he's going to look at this and say, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> why is he still there? He's still there because it's it's never a dull moment with Jikundo. There's always something to grow, something to learn, something to. I like to, that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's always something, something great about it. You know, something to do. You know, with uh, innovative. You know, it's, right. Every time we do something, you know, the students leave and go, "Wow, yeah, that was great." You know, and, and that's that's great. You know, as a teacher, you you, you feel good about that. You see. So if you were to so, ever hear, if you were to ever hear a JKD instructor say, say "I've run out of material to teach," <laughs> you, you see, you don't run out of material. You, because the tools are always the same, but you you have to just figure out how to teach it correctly. Yeah, in different ways. Yeah, which I do. You know, I, you know, if, if I have students that say, you know, they want to teach, you know. And then what I'll do is I'll say, okay, Lee straight thrust. Show me four or five different ways that you would teach it. You know, you know, average guy would just say, focus glove, punch, that's it, you know? Uh-huh. And that's it. You know, you try to do that, 
you know, for a year with students. <laughs> They'll be dropping out after a while. They go, oh, I'm right. tired of this. Yeah, of course. So you have to be innovative in, in, in how to teach that same tool in different ways to keep it interesting. Of okay? course, yes. Uh, so, okay, two, three last questions. What makes, well, no, let, let's make it two. Because you pretty much just talked about what makes a good instructor. What makes a good JKD student? I think uh, the hunger to learn. Uh -huh. If they really, really want to learn, you know. I mean, attendance is very important in the school. Yeah. And if you see somebody coming in once in a while, obviously, you know, he doesn't have the hunger. Yeah. Whereas if you see another student, he wants to train. Yeah. And wants private lessons plus the training. And then you say, wow, this guy has the hunger, you know. Yeah. And they're consistently there never missing, then, then you know, okay, this guy, you know, he wants to absorb like a sponge. He wants to right. absorb all this knowledge, you know? Right, yeah. So you, you, so that's the, the one you, you know, you start mentoring them because okay. uh, you could see it in them. Okay. You know? All right, part A and part B. What in the Jeet Kune Do world would you like to see more of? In the Jeet Kune Do world? Yeah. I think uh, probably, I wish there was a, 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 a Jeet Kune Do body that we all could go to. Mm -hmm. Remember in the old days, like the nucleus, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember when you, I, we were talking to Shannon in the audience, you were behind me, I was in front of you. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. 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 And, and she was saying, you know, she doesn't know if she wants to take Jeet Kune Do because uh, she doesn't know if she has the right to do that, you know, and so forth. But... If, if there was a, 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 a place where everyone could go to and settle things and, and there was a, a manual or, you know, or they themselves say, okay, you know, these are the instructors, these are not, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, you know it, it, I think that would have been a, a great thing, you know, but yes. unfortunately that's not what's happening. So, you know, you have everybody going left and right with this thing. And okay. So since, we, since you we mentioned... We can't be the Jekyll Do police. <laughs> since you mentioned the manual... When are we going to get your version of something like this? <laughs> it's funny because I'm actually working on it. Okay. That's Joaquin. Joaquin's a great guy. Yeah. That's yeah. his book. Great yeah. book, right? It's, yeah. a, it's yeah. great. It, He's a really, really nice guy too, Joaquin. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, and, and, uh, I, I tell people, too, you know what You know what are among my favorite um, mm -hmm. JKD books are um, the, the, the Straight Lead. Mm -hmm. Right and um, Terry Tom, Terry Tom, yeah, her two books. I love them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love them. You know, I, I, I think that they, they are, they are. Th these are books that show that simplicity is the height of cultivation. Well, that's what it's all about, simplicity, right? Right. But unfortunately, you got to write a thick book like this to teach what simplicity is all about, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's the. It, it, isn't that the yin yang of it, though? Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, there's some good books out there and you know, Joaquin's book is one of them, you know. Yeah. Um but uh I I but I don't know, I, I'm just uh, I'm the kind of person that likes to read, you know, Bruce's notes mm -hmm. like crazy. And I, I mean <laughs> even collect them, you know. <laughs> Look at this. Commentaries of the Marshall Way, but wow. the real commentaries because it's really Bruce, right. Bruce's real notes. You yes. know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I like to read and reread because mm -hmm. sometimes when you reread, you relearn, you know. <laughs> yeah. And you pick up something, something different, you know. So yeah. All right. So it's it's good stuff. Okay. Well, listen. I just got I just got the 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 alarm that that my phone's losing power. <laughs> right so that's the signal that's the signal I thank you from the bottom of my heart okay this, this you're I, really, I really appreciate your taking taking the time to do this and um you're welcome. i wish you all the best so where should thank people you. go to um well i know they got to go to jkdmartialarts.com to hear the funky mm -hmm. end to the dragon rap song <laughs> that's <Right>? it <laughs> um is that the best place to find you yeah because it gives you my address Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. We're losing power, man. Thanks so much again for doing this. I, I, we got to do, do it at least a second time, all right?
<laughs> Let's go for it. Yeah. Okay. All right, man. Right. Take care. Have a Very good, good. Evening. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. That's JKD, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Um, so what, oh, gosh, that was excellent. I, I, I really, really en enjoyed that. Okay, so listen, um, that's it for today. Feel free, uh, share. This is, this is one of the first times that we've had almost as many people still at the end of the, of the dialogue as we started with. So I think that's a, a, a testament to um, Sifu Richard's uh, popularity. So like, share, uh, comment, ask questions, what have you. Um, I saw somebody ask me about having Joaquin Marcelo on. Uh, believe me, that's something that I have expressed to him. So I'm working, I'm working on that. I, to I told you guys way, way back in like episode number one, I will never run out of guests for the Jeet Kune Do dialogues, right? And uh, it's proven, it's proven true, right? Um, yes, Eric, round two with, uh, with Richard Torres. Anyhow, all right, so listen, um, thanks very much for, for logging in. Uh, this time next week, we'll be on with Marcus Charles from MKG uh, Chicago. And uh, next Wednesday at 3 p.m., we'll do another episode of the, uh, the Jeet Kune Do broadcast. Um, Sign up for notifications for when we go live on Facebook and also when we post the edited versions up on the YouTube. Also go to jkdrebel.com forward slash store, make a purchase, support the show. Um, all the proceeds go towards us being able to upgrade what it is that we're doing here for you. All right, guys, have a good evening. Have a great weekend and I'll see you next week. This is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebels signing off. Everybody take care.